Hi there, this is Carl Irwin, and this is going to be a quick rundown on uh, how to set up a synchronization scheme for film score using uh, MuseScore 4. In particular, we're looking at this uh, Jack uh, audio and MIDI branch of MuseScore 4 that's been developed. First of all, you're going to need to get this uh, build. The way you do that is you create an account on GitHub, go to MuseScore's page on GitHub, and then you're going to click on pull requests. Uh, and then when you get to this uh, search bar uh, under open, you'll type in Jack. You'll do a search and you'll find this Jack MIDI support. If you open up the Jack MIDI support page, you'll find the pull request for the Jack MIDI uh, branch. Uh, to get builds, current builds, you'll click on checks. Again, you need to make a, an account to download these. And then over on the left, you'll see all of the builds. Uh, and in our case, we would be going to the Linux build. So you'd click on Linux for me. And then down here, you can see here's the file. You can download it. And it's a zip uh, folder. And then you can uh, uh, remove that from the archive. And it'll be an app image. So I already have this running. Uh, I have it right here. So this is the Jack branch. And you want to keep watching this because it's going to be updated quite frequently as it has been uh, with uh, improved features. And I would invite you to I would invite you to keep aside maybe a copy of it that is functioning now because obviously with each build there can be new problems that are created. And you want to keep one build that's aside. And I don't want to install my updates now, so I'll turn that off. Um, we're going to make a new score. And we'll just make a, we're just going to demonstrate the uh, synchronization uh, uh, scheme here. So we'll just open this. We're not going to write any music, but we'll just open up a, a, a general template here of treble clef. Uh, we want to make sure that this is, uh, I'm going to set this to continuous view. We want to make sure that this is set for Jack. So I'm going to go to Preferences, and down here it says Playback. This is uh, input-output on the main trunk, uh, but in this branch it is listed as Playback. You'll see we have here Jack. So you have All Set and Jack. Um, it's already set uh, by default. We'll hit OK. <clears throat> now one problem with the build so far is that it does not automatically connect the outputs to uh, the sound card. So we'll need to do that uh, especially. So I'm going to open up a, a session manager. We'll open up Keisha. And this has um, Jack Transport, which we're not going to use the transport controls here. We're actually going to use it in uh, the uh, applications that we're going to sync together. You can see Muse Score right here. And then I have uh, the stereo output that I want. Here's OBS I'm recording from. Here is the stereo output. I want to take the left channel and the right channel. And now we should hear MuseScore uh, whenever we play. So I'm just going to move this off to the side. Uh, if, if we put a note in, we can get that note in playback. Okay. Um, now what we want to do is we want to sync it with something. So we're going to open up a Jack Aware program. Now, there are several options for this. You could use, um, I haven't figured out quite how to use XJDO inside of Ardor. It's actually, Ardor points to XJDO. The problem is that Ardor will not play um, XJDO's video uh, in synchronization if it's set to jack transport mode. Uh, I don't know if there's a setting I'm missing or if it is just a flaw. So we're going to actually use video outside of our door and we're not going to use xjdo we want to have a little bit more uh, power and capability to nudge the video and offset it so that it aligns perfectly with MuseScore score 4's playback uh, and then after we do that we'll look at a digital audio workstation uh, situation we'll look at our door and how we can uh, create alignment there as well so i'm going to open up blender this is the uh, relatively current build of blender if you look here on the plus sign, it says add workspace. Um, by default, it does not have the video editor up here, but Blender's got a very powerful video editor. I actually edit all of my videos 
in Blender. Whenever I do filmmaking or even sometimes in uh, YouTube tutorials, I'll do editing and I'll do it in there because it's very, very powerful, very robust. It's got a, a steep learning curve. I'm going to click here and add a new workspace down here under video editing. We click on video editing and it opens up the video editor. Uh, there's a bunch of things I don't need right now. Um, I don't really need to see my uh, file browser. So if I click here in the corner, you see there's a plus sign that shows up. If I click and hold, I can actually drag the, the viewport over and cover that up. Um, I will need to see this over here for the frame rate in a moment. And the resolution by default is going to be HD. Uh, I want to drop in a file, and I actually have one on my desktop. It's this one here. It's just a video from Pixabay of some coastline uh, beach sort of images. I'm going to drop that into the sequencer. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to line this up uh, with the first frame. So this is actually starting on frame one. Now what's interesting about Blender is that it has jack sync capability, but the jack sync actually synchronizes at frame zero, not at frame one. Uh, this is kind of curious because in terms of the uh, time code, we really want to count frame one as one. Uh, so the time code will be a little bit off, but what you could do is drop in an overlay on top of this. You could render out time code for various types of frame rates and then just drop a time code overlay. This is one of the reasons why this is more powerful is that I can do overlay. I can drop video on top of this uh, to give me features that are temporary and without burning in. But I could also drop in sounds. I could render out sounds and drop it directly into this project, and then I could render that out as my reference video. Uh, if I'm sending my score to a filmmaker and I need to send them a reference video, in addition to the audio track, I can send them that. Uh, there's a lot of capability here, but it also gives me the capability to nudge the video because it is a video sequencer and a video editor after all. So what I'm going to do is go down here to the, to the right, bottom right, it says current frame. Uh, and over here to the right of that, it says start and end frame. I'm going to move the start back to zero. And I'm just going to drag my end frames way out so I've got plenty of space to work with. Uh, it only gives you about 250 frames to start with, uh, but that gives me a lot more. Uh, now I want to set this to use Jack Transport. Now the way you do that in Blender is you go to Edit, Preferences, and you do this one time. Every time you open the program after this, it will automatically pick up on the last decision that you made in terms of the audio server. If I go to System, and then down at the bottom, at Sound, if I click on Sound and scroll down, I've already selected it, but I select Jack as the audio device. Uh, and then that will be the default next time you open it up. Now to make it synchronize, I go down to the bottom left, and there's this little tab that says Playback. If I click on playback and I go up to the top, it says sync. Rather than play every frame, which will just play every frame of the video, uh, which means it will slow down if your system resources are being uh, uh, heavily utilized, it will slow down so that you see every frame. This is very important when you're doing animation. You might actually want to watch the video outside of real time and see every single frame of what it is that you're compositing. Uh, in the video editor or whatever you've animated inside of Blender. Blender is an animation tool as well. It's actually a suite. It's a, it's a complete suite of um, CG, visual effects, animation, simulation, and video editing tools. Um, I'm going to click here, and on the bottom, it says Sync to Audio. This will automatically enact the jack transport. So now when I hit Play from Blender on Blender's transport, it will actually run any other program that is also connected to Jack Transport, which in the case of MuseScore 4 and this branch, it is. Okay, We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, the next thing I like to do um, whenever I'm working on this is I usually uh, enable scrubbing on the audio. Uh, that's not necessarily important, but as a habit, I always do that. and It allows me to, uh, whenever I'm moving my cursor through, I can actually hear in real time as I'm scrubbing what the audio is. And This can be very useful when you're doing film score. If I drop a reference track in there or some other track, maybe the um, dialogue track, I can enable and disable 
the background aud uh, uh, audio track of the video, but I can also scrub through and know exactly when things are happening. That helps me to synchronize uh, inside of the uh, music project, the notation project, when I know exactly where things are happening. So I enable that. Um, that's really all we need. At this point, it's ready to go. So uh, the next thing I do want to take care of, though, because it's going to be very important later on, when you drop a video into the uh, video editor, it will automatically pick up on its frame rate. And I need to uh, account for that. So over here, the frame rate of this video is 23.98. It's 24 frames per second, roughly. 23.98 is the actual frame rate. Uh, but if we round, this is really 24 frames. As far as synchronization goes, 24 is our number. So you want to remember that. Every second, 24 frames goes by. So if we ever want to set this at a second, we would set it at 24 frames. If you want to set it at two seconds, you'd set it at 48 and so on. Uh, that's going to be very important uh, later on. So uh, I'm going to uh, declutter here. I'm just going to move these parts over and I'm going to resize. And I'll move this down. Just kind of open up my real estate. Now, um, if we bring up MuseScore, another thing I like to do uh, when working on Linux is with my distribution. I'm on Ubuntu Studio. If you right button click on the uh, window border, uh, it will give you some options for more actions, and I can click on keep above others. So this will always keep my video uh, layer above everything else. That way, I can work on the score or inside of DAW, and the video will stay on the surface above the window without uh, uh, moving to the back every time I click on the uh, secondary applications. Uh, let's go back to MuseScore. Now you'll see what will happen if I click back to the very beginning uh, and I do want to make sure that my video is aligned properly. And I have to slide this back to frame zero. There we go. Now, whenever I uh, hit play from here, you'll see the playhead will move in MuseScore. And we have synchronization. Not only that, but I can actually move forward. So if I seek forward on the timeline in Blender, and you'll see that it'll pick up a little further down. You'll see it'll pick up over here. Um, if I zoom way out and I move down even further and I hit play, you'll see the playhead jumps forward. So the playhead will follow wherever I uh, click on the um, uh, timeline here. So I want to keep my timeline available, keep my transport available, uh, and that's how it works. Now, I want to demonstrate how we can synchronize, and this will apply not only for Blender, but also for... Um, the digital audio workstation when we look at that here in a moment. Let me close down the mixer here. Uh, I'm gonna put some notes in and we're just gonna do a quick demonstration of, of, of what the synchronization problems are. If I click uh, on, on uh, the edit tool, I'm just gonna put in some notes. Just on beat one uh, of everything. Uh, in fact, I'm going to uh, change these I want a very, very short note. So I'll just change these to 16th note. So we get a very, very short attack. And uh, if I go back to the beginning, and we'll, again, we'll use the transport from Blender as master. Go back to the beginning. Everything seems to synchronize quite well. It seems to, okay? But what I'm gonna do is do a little test here. Uh, I'm going to render this out. Uh, in fact, I'm going to move these notes up so we can get some contrast. So just move them up to the top, put them on an E. And I'm going to render this. So I'll export, render as wave. And we'll just export this uh, to the desktop. And it's done. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this file now into Blender. Okay, so we can compare it against uh, the uh, sound, the, the the video that we have there. So I'll grab, grab this track. Whoops, grab this track, 
we'll drop it in and um, I'm going to move this down here right above. Actually, I think I want to do this. Move this up. So this is going to synchronize exactly at frame zero. Okay, so we set it to zero. Um, I think what I want to do here too is I will uh, display the waveform so you can see these little hits. So you can see the little spots here, the little hits. Now, if I play this back, uh, you're going to hear some mismatch delay. Uh, and so that you really hear it, I'm going to select these notes. And I'm going to drop them an octave. So the low notes are coming from MuseScore, and the higher notes are coming from the rendered output. We'll go back to the first frame. And I hit play. So you can hear that. That high is coming first. But um, but um, but um, but um. You see how that's happening? Um, because Blender's pl or, or, or MuseScore's playback is very slightly behind, very slightly behind. It's about uh, initially I thought it was gonna. It was more like 250 milliseconds. It's actually about 25 milliseconds is what it is. I found this to be consistent across systems. It just is the amount of time. I haven't found any discrepancies between uh, the various computers that I've tested this out on. You can try this and see uh, for you if it's any different. We can actually resolve this problem, though, uh, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to add a measure uh, before this. I'm going to insert a measure before the selection, just one measure, and then in this measure, I'm going to put a tempo. So if I come over here, I'm going to add a tempo marking and the tempo I'm going to set to uh, 120 beats per minute to start with. I'm also going to, uh, to be consistent, I'm going to add uh, a, a time signature on the second measure. We're actually going to start everything on measure two rather than in measure one. Measure one is going to be a buffer. Okay. Now at 120 beats per minute, uh, we're looking at, uh, what is it, two seconds worth of time. Okay, two seconds worth. So 60 beats per minute would be uh, 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 one second per beat. At 120, it's two beats per second. So this is, a, a measure 4-4 is actually two seconds worth of time. you got to remember that. Uh, I'm going to add another... Uh, 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 tempo change here. So we're going to put another one. I want to make this drastically different just so that we can really test this. I'm going to make this 144. It's not drastically different, but it's considerably a different tempo. It's a faster tempo. Now what I want to do is I want to account for this first measure inside of Blender. And we would do the same thing later on. Now this will seem a little confusing at first, but remember you can always make a template and save it. And then you will open this up when you go to film score and it will always be set. The one thing you have to remember though, is that this is dependent upon frame rate. Frame rate is what dictates how many frames you're going to offset. In this case, we're at 24 frames per second. So if I want to go two seconds out, my starting frame needs to be 48. Okay, so I'm going to go out to 48 frames. And then I need to take uh, my sounds, and I'm going to drag them over to frame 48 so that they're starting exactly at the beginning of the start time. Now, what this does is, as far as my Blender project, is when I go back to the beginning of the project, it's now 48 is the beginning frame. Okay, that's the beginning frame. That's two seconds out. Now what I want to do is I'm going to um, create a time delay, or rather a time advancement in MuseScore. The way I do this is I change this number, this 120 beats. This is a static delay problem, which means that if I change this number and make it faster, the static delay will be offset into the past. Okay. In this case, if I want to make it 25 milliseconds, this number is going to be 123. Because it's 25 milliseconds. Remember, that's 25 out of 1,000. We're looking at 
a 2.5% change uh, in speed. It's going to be 2.5% quicker uh, as we play through this first measure, which actually is never going to be played. This is the real beginning. I have to re-render this because these notes down here are actually at 120. So I'm going to uh, get rid of that. I'm going to quickly temporarily delete this. Okay, and I'm going to render this out. And that's what you'd have to do. When you go to render your file, you want to remove the first measure and then render from there and it will be correct. So export this to untitled score, replace. And we're good. And now control Z to return. Now this is just a test after all. This is not um, this is not actually how we would do this. Okay, this is so this is a test. You would actually uh, deal with this in a template. Save that aside, and then you would just open up your template. I'll drop this sound in. I'll synchronize this up again back at forty-eight, and we will minimize. Now, and we hear low notes all together. Now let's get some contrast because I didn't. I, now we have the low notes are down here. The high notes are in mu score. Use the right transport. And you can hear they're synchronized, perfectly synchronized, right? If I go back to the beginning, that the very first one sounds odd now here's something you should be aware of when you're writing score beat one at the very beginning of the video is no man's land there is always going to be a buffer of space and time this is one thing you have to realize those of you that are writing music but don't necessarily do film score work if you want to get into it you will re you will notice that your movie will have some kind of initial buffer there'll be a head a header clip a film at the beginning or the music will start later than frame one that's fine and that's good for us you wouldn't really have this note right here the actual uh, a, a start would be at a later point okay so the, in, when you're working in DAW you do the same thing if you're composing music in digital work digital audio workstation you always have a couple of measures at the beginning where you have some MIDI controller data uh, that is telling uh, the MIDI controllers where they're starting from or key switches that need to be in there to tell the virtual instruments which sound samples are going to be used. There's all that kind of information there. So the beginning is always off limits. The music always starts at a later point. And if, you're, if your video starts immediately at the beginning, you want to insert a clip at the beginning of that, at least a buffer of a few seconds, to allow you that headroom uh, in the score. Okay, But you can hear this. This does synchronize. These hits line up perfectly. Okay, so that's it. I mean, this is what you do. You just you have a, a measure offset. You offset two seconds in frames. Uh, that's the beginning of the project. Whenever I go back in the transport, this is always going back to the beginning of the project, but it's actually going to this point right here in the music always. Okay, and I can still seek ahead. You see what's going on there. That very first one played a little delayed because it's the very first note coming right off of the start, but you can see it actually is synchronized. Okay, it's perfectly synchronized. All right, now that is how you deal with this, and then from here you can compose, and everything will line up later on. As you go down, you can move ahead. Let's say I want to watch the video, um, and I'll watch this video, and I'll find a point where the shot changes. I can see where that happened. is right around here. So I know approximately where it's going. I'm going to hit play, and I'm going to watch up here to see uh, when, where I arrive when that frame changes. So it seems to be right about here at the beginning of this measure. So this might be a good hit point. And I can test this out uh, by placing a note there. 
Um, I tend to use an additional track uh, of a clave track at the very beginning of the score where I will put clicks in just to test against the video. Uh, I, I may find that I need to nudge this a little bit by adding a meter change or a tempo change or something like that, but I can establish a map of metrical changes and tempo changes up here, usually metrical changes. I tend not to change a tempo very much within a cue. Uh, unless it's absolutely necessary for the uh, style and emotion of the music to have some kind of retardando in there or something or an accelerando. Um, but I usually try to lock in a cue within a single tempo relatively from beginning to end. Maybe at the end you would do some kind of transitional uh, tempo change. But I would change the meter for sure to line this up better. Now, I want to test this out. So the way I do that is I uh, click down here in the timeline and move back. And I see that it's a perfect hit. So I'm looking at beat one in this measure. Now, the other thing is, is that my measures are going to be off by one measure. This is actually not measure uh, eight. It's measure nine, even though it's measure eight on the score from the beginning. This will matter more so when we're uh, trying to synchronize with the digital audio workstation. Let's take a look at that real quick. I'm going to open up our door. And I'll just move this out of the way for the moment. Um, and we'll just do a new session, empty template. Um, I'm going to delete all of these notes because we're not going to need them anymore. We're actually going to be able to prove this uh, concept with uh, the metronomes on the application. So we have a metronome playback here on MuseScore, but we also have a metronome playback on our door. And I have our door open right now in another screen. I'm going to get rid of the uh, reference track here. And I'll uh, minimize this. Okay, here's our door. Now our door, I'm also going to set for Jack Transport. Now I'm not going to show you how to do this because you should know your own digital audio workstation, but you need to set up in the preferences uh, how you're going to uh, set your Jack Transport uh, um, data. So I'll, I'll enable that. I'm going to get rid of a few of these markers here real quick. I don't want cue markers or CD loop punch range markers. I want tempo bars, time signature, and time code. Now. I want to emulate exactly what I'm doing in the MuseScore file. I have um, a measure that is a buffer, and then the score starts at measure 2. The tempo that I have at measure 2 is 144. So I'm going to right button click, and I'm put, going to put new tempo. I'm going to select that tempo, and I'm going to change it to 144. I hit apply. Now, in MuseScore, my tempo in measure 1 is 123, but remember that's the offset tempo. The actual tempo that it's supposed to be is 120. That would be a two-second interval, a true two-second interval. I'm compensating for MuseScore 4's delay in the playback engine. And it is a static delay again. I can click anywhere on the timeline, and it will always be in synchronization just because that very first measure has been changed. Um, I'm also going to add down here a new time signature, even though it's actually the same one, uh, just for consistency. Uh, so I've got a 4-4 and a 4-4 here. Now, I want this one to read 120 because our door does not have a delay. Our door does not have a delay in playback. It's going to be accurate to the jack transport. The, there's no engine here that we're compensating for, as there is with MuseScore 4. So now what I should have is I should have a start point that starts at measure two. Um, the way we can do this, we'll quickly just add a, uh, a MIDI track, and I'll just add a synth, add that in, and uh, I'll make a uh, region here. We'll drop the start point over to there. I'll drag my end point way out. Uh, we won't necessarily need to use this, but we could put some notes in to test this out. Now, when I click back to the beginning of this transport, it will go back to measure two. And now this will also do the same thing that Blender is doing. Now, if I open up Blender, you'll see that measure two is in the same place. If I hit play from Blender, the transport will play in everything. It will play in MuseScore, it'll play in our door, it'll play in Blender. If I click back on the transport in our door, 
it will take Blender back to the beginning, and it will also take MuseScore 4 back to the beginning as well. So let me just slide this down and out of the way. So I've got our door here. I've got MuseScore 4 up here. I've got Blender here. Now we're going to do a little test. I'm going to enable the metronome in our door and the metronome in MuseScore 4. What I should get now is metronomes that are synchronized between these two applications along with the video that is synchronized to uh, uh, frame one. And I can press the uh, transport play from Blender or from Ardour, and I can seek from Blender or Ardour. It does not really matter. And my measure numbers are going to line up between Ardour and MuseScore 4. So if I hit play, You've got perfectly aligned synchronization on these uh, metronomes. So the metronomes are playing exactly together. They're reading everything together. I can click ahead to another location and everything will synchronize. And if I hit play, we still have synchronization. This will hold up even if I do tempo changes and meter changes. The key is, is that I just need to make sure that I synchronize my tempo and meter changes in my notation file as well as with my uh, 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 digital audio work, workstation uh, track. So I need to make sure that my, my maps align. What would you use this for? Well, if you're just writing in MuseScore 4, you really don't need, you don't need our door at all. You don't need a digital audio, audio workstation. You can just compose directly from MuseScore 4, and you can eyeball your hits based on your seeking points through Blender, uh, the video playback, and identify where you want those things to go. Now, one quick thing about this uh, before I, I talk about the, 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 the purpose of this here. You should know when you're writing music for picture, if you've not done this before and you've not been trained in this way, the rule is that anything that's within about two tenths of a second, just a little bit quicker, a little less than a quarter of a second, especially if it's after, if the sound is after the visual event, if you're within two tenths of a second from a visual event, particularly after, that sound that you create within that time frame will psychologically be associated with what you see. A lot of people uh, who get into film scoring and have these conversations about uh, uh, synchronization, they get concerned about hyper synchronization, meaning that everything is mathematically perfectly aligned. That is not actually a concern. We want things to be very aligned, and we've done we've gone through great pains here to add a buffer to make things lined up. But the fact of the matter is, is you just need to be within a quarter of a second, a little less than a quarter of a second after something visual happens in order to associate a sound with it. Most cues will change even longer than that after it when you're talking about uh, film score. If you're constantly lining everything up to happen within that two-tenths of a second range with almost every hit, you'll do what we call Mickey Mousing. It will start to seem like a cartoon where the music is just accentuating every major movement. That's undesirable unless you're doing comedy or action uh, or comedy action, you know, some of those kinds of 1980s action movies that were a lot of fun, Spielberg kind of movies. Uh, you do a lot of Mickey Mousing for that style of, of picture. Um, that's usually not desirable, though. Usually what you're going to be scoring against is an emotional response, which is going to happen more delayed than that two-tenths of a second. But in terms of finding a good hit point, you only need to be that close. You really do not need to change meter as much as you think. You really only need to change meter to get an alignment on a very strong hit on a downbeat if it's a really, really important hit. Generally speaking, you can just respond on the next available strong beat after something has happened musically, and that will be adequate enough. You just need to find where that's at. There's a lot of uh, a, a talk out there about finding the right tempo uh, for a track in a film. This is, I think... Uh, uh, um, I believe this is thinking too too hard about the problem. 
honestly, it's my opinion and my experience, and from what I've seen of other composers, uh, good composers, it's better to pick a tempo that suits the mood and the style and the psychological impact that you're after. Do not worry about where the hits are happening in the picture to calculate uh, what tempo you should be using. You should use a tempo that works for the type of music that you're trying to write to convey the type of emotional narrative or physical narrative that is required for the picture. If you're trying to create alignment, you want to rather and than, than using a kind of mean perfect tempo, you want to focus more on metrical changes, changing the meter or finding the right beat within a measure to align a particular hit. So that's just my advice on this. Don't get too caught up in hyper uh, synchronization. Think more about that two tenths of a second rule within a quarter of a second, specifically that something's happening after the visual element in order to accentuate it. So now, why would you synchronize uh, the digital audio workstation with this? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is that you might have video playing from your DAW. You might not be using an external video editor. This might be the way that you're doing your video. And then you can export your audio file when you're ready to mix down and drop it into the DAW, and then you can export to video from there as for, for reference video. That might be one reason. But another reason is you might be incorporating uh, synths or other virtual instruments inside of the DAW that are not well suited for a Muse score. You might want to be using the MIDI control uh, aspect of your DAW, which gives you a lot more fine control than what MuseScore can offer for those types of virtual instruments. Uh, and in this way, you can synchronize. So I would add my instruments in here. I would have my synchronization set up with my buffer measure, my start point for the project. And then I could compose in here using MIDI data and MIDI controllers. And then I could compose up here uh, using uh, notation. And one thing I can do is I can actually pipe I could actually pipe my audio output uh, to, zoom out here, from MuseScore into our door. I could create a bus here where the output comes into our door and can be mixed down. From there, I could actually add various effects if I wanted to. I could add a reverb. I could make everything dry on here, and then I could add a reverb for the entire project inside of the DAW. And in, in doing so, I would actually be mixing all of my instrument sources together into one environment. And there's a big benefit to that. And then I can compose in this way in real time, and I would hear reasonably what it sounds like. And when I'm ready to actually do it, I would render out my file, I'd delete this first frame, make a copy of this, delete my first uh, uh, measure, render that out, drop it into the project, and then uh, I would assign it to that same bus and I would get the, the same kind of outcome with a little higher fidelity because it's not playing in real time. So anyway, this is the process you can go through. Now, what can you do with this? Well, I could uh, delete this uh, track here. And then I could save this uh, as a template or as a project file that I can open up as a template. I could... Uh, save this as a project file that I would open up as a template and I could keep adding instruments and then make a score every time I do it. Again, I might use something up here maybe like claves instead of this and then I can use it as an above track that I'm always using for hit points uh, to uh, dictate where my hits are happening. And um, I probably wouldn't save the Blender file because video will always be different frame rates. You might have 23.98 uh, frames, 24. You might have 30 frames, uh, 29 point whatever, uh, you might have various types of frame rates that you're dealing with. Uh, so you might not necessarily save this, but it's a simple matter of just looking at the frame rate, moving it double that frame rate ahead to give you two seconds, and then that is your starting point, and then everything will line up with your other uh, uh, files. So anyway, that is using Blender as video playback. Uh, and again, you can drop exported files into Blender for uh, an instant uh, a reference video, you can just render it out right from here and it will uh, put the video and audio all together. You can send that to your director with overlays or whatever. It gives you a lot of power. Um, 
you can save this as a template. You can save your DAW project as a template. Now you always have the offset taken care of in that first measure. And from here, these tempos can be whatever you want. The meters can be whatever you want. It will always align once you get past that first measure. And keep in mind that the measure doesn't even count because the starting point for Blender and for uh, the uh, workstation here is at measure two. So I'm always seeking back to that very first uh, location. Very, very easy to navigate around. So that's a quick rundown. Uh, that's where you can get this uh, a build. Uh, that is how it works in Blender as a video player. And that's how you would offset it inside of the DAW. Those of you that are getting into film scoring or you want to find a way to use uh, what is available to us now, this is how you would do it. And uh, I wish you the very best of luck with this. Happy composing and happy mixing.